Okay, so last time I told you what a parabolic subgroup is. Right? So that's what we're going to talk about today. So we said we have a if we have a Coxeter system, W comma S, then we can define the parabolic subgroups which are indexed by J. So J is a subset of S, and this is the subgroup generated by set of J. Okay. And so, let's see, last time we, we proved a couple of things about this. For example, we proved that this is a Coxeter group whose set of generators can be taken to be J. And we proved that the length function for wj is basically the length function for w, but only restricted to the words that are generated by j. So what I want to do today is, last time I also stated several propositions about how the different parabolic subgroups interact. So for example, we showed that, or I stated that the intersection of two parabolic subgroups is a parabolic subgroup, that the union generates a parabolic subgroup. But what I want to do today is focus on the situation where I, I'm thinking about a single parabolic subgroup and see what I can say about that. So today, we're going to focus on a single subset J. I want to th think about the parabolic subgroup and I want to think about the cosets of that subgroup. So that's the plan. And to do that, maybe I will start by doing an example, which will motivate a lot of what I will say today. So let's take our usual example of the symmetric group generated by S1 and S2. Actually, let me just call them A and B to make the notation a little bit simpler. So this is the Coxeter diagram. Um, okay, so there aren't a lot of choices for J here. So let me just take J to be the single generator A. Okay. And so the parabolic subgroup consists of the, the things generated by A, and that's very simple. It's just the identity and A. Right? Now, what I want to think about now is Let's think about the, the right cosets, sorry, the left cosets of, of this guy. Okay. And the way that I'm going to think about them, I'm going to actually draw them in the poset. So we know that in the Ruhat order we have A, uh, sorry, the identity is the bottom element. We know that it looks like a hex hexagon, right? It's a little bigger. So it looks like a hexagon. with these two cross edges here. So this is the identity, this is A, this is B, this is uh, AB, this is BA, and this is ABA. Okay? So let's think about the cosets. So the cosets are obtained by multiplying a single element of the group on the left by these guys. So what are the cosets? Well, the first coset consists of this guy and this guy, right? This is the coset E, W, J. Then we have another coset consisting of B and A, B. Right? And then we have a, another coset consisting of B, A, and a, B, A. Okay. So these are the three cosets. This is uh, W, J. This is B, W, J. And this is A, B, W, J. Okay. Sorry. This is... Uh, did I do this correctly? It should be... 
be B A. What is it that I want to say here? <coughs> Which is probably, well, let me, what I'm going to do is switch this guy and this guy. Because I, I'm thinking of left coset. So B goes with BA, and AB goes with ABA. Okay? So these are the three left cosets of subgroup WJ. Okay? You can imagine I can tell you exactly the same story with right cosets, but for the whole class today, I'm going to focus on left cosets. Okay? So, we look at this here, and we see that, the, that the, these cosets kind of run in parallel. And what I want to do is I, I want to show the following. I want to show that, basically, this is the general story, that the, that the cosets look like these little lumps, and there's always a bottom element in each one of the left cosets. Okay. And so basically, a good way of labeling the left cosets is going to be by just calling them by their bottom element. That's what I'm going to do. So what are the bottom elements here? They are E, B, and A, B. Okay. So I, I will show in general that each coset has a unique minimal element. Okay. And I'm going to call the set of minimal elements W super J, which in this case is E, B, and A, B. Okay. So definition. First, let me define what this set is, and then I will prove that it consists of the minimum elements of each coset. So the, w, the set W super J consists of the elements of the Coxeter group such that whenever you multiply, whenever you multiply them by one of the generators in J, on the right you make them big. Um, let me state this in a few different ways. So you can think of this as elements which are not, I don't know if shortenable is a word. Is that a word? We'll make it a word today. Sure. You, that cannot may be made short, shorter <laughs> by <laughs> elements not. Un unshrinkable. Unshrinkable, that's much better. <laughs> Unshrinkable <laughs> by J. Okay. By which I mean by multiplying on the right by J. Okay. Um, now you can verify that this is exactly the same thing as saying that these are elements such that none of the reduced words end with a letter in J, okay? So, no reduced word for W ends in a letter S in J, okay? You can see one direction because if, if you did have a reduced word that ended in S in J, then you would multiply on the right by that S and make it shorter. And it's a... It's an easy exercise to, to see that this is anything only if. Okay. So this is WJ, and this is called the parabolic quotient corresponding to J. Okay. And my plan is to show that this set exactly plays the role that I, that I claim it has here. So let me make it, in, draw it in green here, maybe, in I don't know, purple, I guess this is. Um, this is the set W super J. Okay. 
and I claim that for any coxeter group, W super J plays this role, uh, that they're exactly the minimal representatives of the cosines. Okay, that's the plan. So, let's go ahead and prove that proposition. Every element of the Coxeter group factors uniquely as W equals W super J, W sub J, okay? Where W super J is W super j is in the parabolic quotient, and W sub j is in the parabolic subgroup. Okay. And furthermore, this factorization has the property that it respects the length. So the length of W is equal to the length of W super j plus the length of W sub j. Okay. So this is the first thing that I will show on the way to proving what I'm claiming about this parabolic quotient. Okay. Okay. So let's think about what this says. I have a Coxeter group element w and I want to write it as something that you cannot shrink using j times something which is generated by j. So basically you, you're thinking that you're, you're putting things as much as you can and then you're going to put a bunch of elements of j in here. Okay. So let, let me show you how you actually construct this factorization. So. <coughs> So to prove this, first I'll, uh, we'll prove existence and uniqueness. Okay, so existence. I want to write W. Let me rewrite this a little bit differently. W times WJ inverse equals W super J. Now, what are we doing here? We're saying this W is my input, right? I'm given a Coxeter group element W, and what I have to do is multiply it by a bunch of J's, a bunch of things that are in J, in such a way that I get to something that I cannot shorten using J's. So my plan is basically to take W and start multiplying by J, making it shorter, 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 shorter using J's until I'm stuck. And when I'm stuck, I'm going to have this WJ. So the idea is I multiply, basically I shrink W, I shorten W using J's, using elements of J until I can't anymore. Okay? So that's my plan. I basically start with W and I see whether there's any element of J that will make it shorter. And if there is, I multiply by it. Then I see whether I can multiply by any element of J and make this shorter. And if there is, I do that. And I keep doing it. I keep doing it until I get stuck. Okay? So this is something such that it's unshrinkable. by J. I'm glad you told me this word unshrinkable. So in my notes it says unshortenable the whole time. So replace it when you, when you print it or photocopy it or whatever. So I take this. So I take J1, J2, up to JK, which are in J, such that I get this. And that's basically it. I, I'm going to say that this is my W sub J inverse, and this is my W super J. Okay. So I take W sub J equals the inverse of this thing, 
right? And I take w super j to be w j1 up to jk. It's clear that this is a factorization where this guy is generated by j, and this guy is unshrinkable by j by definition. Okay, so obtaining a factorization is is not hard. You just multiply by j until you can't. Okay. But maybe I think I think this should seem a little strange to you because I'm claiming that this is a unique process. And I really did, it, did this in a lot of freedom. I just said, just pick some random j that will shorten, then pick some other random j that will shorten and keep doing this. And in principle, there could be many possible outcomes for this process. And what I, I'm going to show is that even though the individual choices of j1, j2, et cetera, might change, this product is not going to change. Okay? This is not going to change. This is not going to change. So I'll prove that. But before proving that, let me prove this statement about the lengths. Uh, it's easy, because what's the length of w, j1, up to jk? Well, we see that I started with w, which had length w, length L of w, and then at each step, I multiplied by a generator and made myself shorter. I know that every time I'm, I multiply by a generator, I either go up by one or down by one in length. But I'm going down each time, so that means that the length of this guy is the length of this one minus k steps. Okay. So basically, to, to finish, the only thing I have to prove is that this is the length of this guy. Okay. So why, why does this guy have length k? Well, here's an expression of length k. How can I show that this expression could not be made shorter? Well, let me say it in words. The thing is, if I found a shorter expression for j1 up to jk, let's say that here I have five generators, but I can reduce it to three generators, then I could go from w down to here using three generators which means that I would drop rank only three times. But I did drop, drop five times. So I do need five generators that are going to drop each time. And that means that this is a reduced word. Which means that the length of w super j is the length of w minus the length of w sub j. So that proves existence, that, pro that proves that I can factor this, and that proves this equality. And so it remains to prove uniqueness. Okay. So how am I going to prove uniqueness? I'm going to say the following thing. Suppose that this is not unique. So let's suppose that I have two different factorizations, w super j, w sub j, and I don't know, v super j, v sub j. And I need to prove that actually these are not different factorizations. These are the same factorization. So let me rewrite this equation as w super j equals, what is it? v super j, v sub j, w sub j inverse. Okay. So let's parse this for a second. What I'm trying to prove is that really w super j and v super j are the same thing. And this is just the identity. Okay. Well, you should look at this. Here, I'm writing an element of w super j. And we know that elements in w super j cannot end in letters in j. But it looks like it ends in letters in J. And, and this is going to be my contradiction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let's choose some reduced word for this guy and some reduced word for this guy. Okay. So I have a word, some other word. And when I multiply them, I get W super J. 
that may or may not be reduced. Right? Each individual thing is reduced, but maybe the, the whole thing is not reduced. So let's reduce it until we do get something reduced. Reduce to get a reduced word for w super j. Well, you see, a reduced word for w super j cannot end in letters that are in j. And that means that there's no way that this reduced word for w super j uses any of this stuff. Yeah, this, this can't end in j, so it can't use anything here. Anything in the word for vj w j inverse, okay? So if it doesn't use this, it means that it's a subword of v super j. Okay? So w super j is a subword of a reduced word for v super j, and we know what that means. That exactly means being less than in the Bruhar order. Is that clear what I did there? I can't use this stuff, so I must be a reduced word of this guy, which makes me smaller than it. Okay. But now, I basically say, well, there wasn't anything special about W that makes it preferable to V. We could make exactly the same argument the other way around and obtain that V super J is less than W super J, and, and that's it. So repeat in the other direction to obtain v super j less than or equal to w super j and that shows that actually they are equal and then if, if these guys are equal then the other guys have to be equal too okay why can't we just say they're equal if we, i mean it says are you proving that vj wj inverse is the identity there, when you say we can't use anything? Well, the thing is, so let, let's, I see your point. Let's go through this argument again. I, I wrote W super J as some reduced word here times some reduced word here. And then I said, reduce this whole thing. Okay. In that reduction, I cannot be using any letters from here. But these letters might exist. I mean, in principle, it could be that this is that this is not the identity. It's just that the, when, when I do the reduction, I knock off all the things that are here. So I can't just say this is the identity. And so that's why I have to continue and say, well, I didn't use it. And so I have to go to the Bruhard order. But at this point, this, in principle, this could not be the identity. In the end, it turns out that it is. So this shows that nice factorization theorem. And in particular, it's good to see how, how that plays out here. So W sub j is this. W super j is E, B, A, B. And so what this theorem is saying, you see what this theorem is saying is something extremely explicit. It's saying that. The elements of the Coxeter group are precisely the things that you obtain by multiplying one of these guys by one of these guys in every possible way. And so let's, let's see it in action. Let's first let multiply by E. E times E, E. E times A, A. Then B. B times E, B. B times A, B, A. And then A, B times E, A, B. A, B times A, A, B, A. So this is something extremely explicit. We can say that it's the cardinality of W divided by the cardinality of W sub J. That's a, that's a very good question, actually. So what about enumeration? For example, 
what this tells you is that the order of the Coxeter group is the order of W sub J times the order of W super J. Okay? But now I could change J and obtain that the order of W is the order of some other W J times the other. And so what that's going to tell you is that it's likely that W factors into a lot of things. Because here we're finding a lot of factors for it. Any order of any parabolic subgroup divides it. Okay? And just like for the Coxeter group, which is a symmetric group, the size is n factorial, which is a very nice number that has a lot of very nice factors, it's going to happen in a lot that the size of W has a very nice size with a lot of nice factors that explain these factorizations. And actually, there's a whole chapter of the book devoted to enumerating in Coxeter groups because this is the beginning of showing that actually the enumeration is very nice. There's a lot of nice numerology going on here. We'll get to it, actually. We'll, we'll prove some nice things about this. Okay. Okay. So, so having that, proving the claim that I stated is very easy. So corollary. The coset W times W sub J has exactly one unique element, which is minimum. Which is precisely little w super j. Exactly what I said here, that each one of the red cosets has a unique bottom element, and those bottom elements are precisely the W super J's. Okay. So first of all, why is it that W super J is the smallest thing here? Well, first let me, let me show you something. What's the length of WJ? Well, the length of WJ is the length of WJ. I'm going to show that it's that everything else has a longer length. So what's the length of W? Let me take some element, let's say W um, V which is in W, W sub J. Okay. So why is this element longer than this one? This element is longer than this one because I can write WV as W super J, W sub J, V. Now, this thing is in the parabolic quotient, and this thing is generated by J, because you see W sub J, by definition, is generated by J, and V is in W sub J. So this thing is in W sub J, and that means that this is the unique factorization of this guy as something in the quotient times something in the subgroup. And then I can apply my length property that says that the length of WV is equal to the length of W super J plus the length of W sub J V. And I have no idea what this is, but it's bigger than zero. Bigger than or equal to zero. Okay. So anything in double in in the coset is greater have length greater than or equal to this guy. Maybe I should say why why is why is this guy in this coset? It's very important. This guy is in this coset because I can write it as W times what is it? It's basically uh, W times 
wj inverse, right? And so this writes it, w super j as w times something generated by the j's. So this thing is in w, wj. I show that everything in w, wj has length greater than or equal to it. Okay? So that means that if there is a, a lowest element, it's going to be this one. And now let me show that this really is less than everything here. How do I show that w super j is less than or equal to wv for any wv in here? Well, basically, I make the same argument. Yeah? I say, because of this factorization, Because of this factorization, then, then that's it. Yeah, I take a reduced word for this guy, a reduced word for this guy, and, and make the same argument over there. And so this shows, this shows precisely this property over here. Now, there's, a, there's an exercise in the homework. I ask you to do this for a bigger poset, but so let me show you another corollary. Which is that I want to say something a little bit stronger than what I have said so far. This is W sub J and this is W super J. Now not only are these sets, but they're actually posets. Yeah. What's the poset of W sub J? Well, it's basically the, the induced poset. What's the poset of W super J? It's the induced poset. So just if things are less than in W, then you call them less than in WJ. Okay. And so what I've done so far basically shows to you that the product of this poset and this poset lives inside here. Now, what does it mean to take a product of two posets? Well, maybe let me, I'll state the corollary, which is that the product of posets W sub j times W super j, the other way around, right? Well, it doesn't really matter, but is a sub poset of W. Now, what do I what do I mean when I say product of posets? So first of all, proof. Just think about it for a second and you'll see that we proved it already. But this is kind of funny to prove something and then explain it to you. Um, what is this saying? Well, what is the, the product of two posets? So if, if P and Q are posets, then I'm going to define the, the product posets by saying, first of all, what are, this, what are the elements? The elements are pairs P comma Q, where P is in P. And Q is in Q. Okay. So that's the set, and I have to tell you what the order is. And the order is going to be given by saying that PQ is less than or equal to P prime Q prime if and only if in each coordinate each coordinate is less than the other one. Okay. So So this inequality is true in the product poset P times Q if and only if this one is true 
in the poset P, and this one's true in the poset Q. Okay. But maybe the easiest way, I think, to to think about this is is really just to draw it. So, how do you take the product of two posets? Let's say that you take, I don't know, let's take this poset. And let's multiply it by um, this poset. Okay, a poset of four elements ten times a poset of three elements. So the product poset is going to have twelve elements, and they're going to be pairs of something here times something here. And the way you're going to draw it is you're just going to put a copy of this poset on each one of the vertices of this one. Okay. So this equals the following thing. It's kind of fun. That's why that's why it's an exercise in the homework. It's fun to do it. You do this, and then on each one of these guys you put a copy of this poset. So on this one you go like this. On this one, you go like this. On this one, you go like this. On this one, you go like this. And then basically, you at each level, you, you fill in the same relations. Okay, so. so that's it. And so you'll have to do it in, in, in the homework, and you'll see exactly. You'll get practice with it. Uh, but so what I'm saying here is, well, what's the product of the of the red the red guy times the purple guy? It's basically putting a red guy on top of each one of the purple guys. And so you see that the product poset is this thing, and it's a sub poset. Now it's very important for you to notice that it's not the poset itself. It's only a sub poset and it's not equal because, for example, A is less than AB in my Bruhat order and, it's not, and A is not less than AB in the product poset. Why? Because if I want to know if this is less than this, I have to compare the red coordinates and I have to compare the purple coordinates. And in the red coordinate, this one is actually bigger than this one. Okay. So it's a sub poset, not, not an isomorphism. So, so how should you be thinking about this factorization then? I mean, really, really, this is a pretty accurate picture. The idea is that you have W, and you have W sub J is some subgroup generated by J. And so it looks something like this, I don't know. It's kind of hard to draw in a meaningful way. But. Okay. And so what we're saying is that basically you can cover the whole poset W by little copies of that red thing, right? So kind of like this. These are the cosets. They look kind of like this. They all look the same. Okay. These are all the different cosets. And each one of those cosets has a, a unique minimum element. And if you look at those minimum elements, then those are exactly the parabolic quotient. W super J. Okay. So this is this picture is a pretty good summary of this statement and of that corollary over there. Okay. 
And so, do you have any questions about this picture? This picture is very important. I don't know if it's a good picture, but, but it's an important picture. Maybe. So there is some soap posted here, right? So, so it looks like, I don't know. Maybe it's something like this. I don't know. And so the. Are, are you saying that this, this guy should be purple? There should, be, there should be one purple dot per red blob. A red blob is a coset, right? And this is very similar to the, to, to the picture of how you learn cosets in group theory. Right? Except now we have an additional structure of a poset on it. But for example, the top guy is not purple, probably, because the purple guys are the smallest elements of their coset. And the top guy is bound not to be the smallest element of its coset. So, so how should you how should you imagine that this picture corresponds to this picture? The the purple guys are this one, this one, and this one. And the red blobs are this one and this one and this one. So the maximum element is sitting inside of one of these blobs. And so the maximum element sits on top of exactly one of these blobs, and and it's it's unless it's a trivial thing, this guy is not gonna be purple. If this guy is purple, then everything is its own coset. Okay. okay. Any other questions about this picture? You'll draw it. You'll you'll draw it in practice for. I think you have to do it for S four. Um, and then a lot of what I'm saying here will come to life, and you'll actually see how it, how it takes place. Because that example is too small to look interesting. It's a little bit interesting, but in S4, you'll see how this is really nice. OK. So what do I get? For each W, I get a unique factorization. And that means that I'm going to I get a projection map. Which I'm going to call projection sub j, which goes from the Coxeter group to the parabolic quotient. And it takes w to w super j. Now, if you, look, if you look at it in terms of this statement, it doesn't sound so easy. For each w, you factor it as w sub super j times w sub j, and you map w to w super j. But if you look at this picture, the map is a very simple one. The only thing I'm doing is taking each red coset and mapping it to the bottom element of it. Simple map. There's no technical meaning for a projection map. It's just convenient. It's a, a projection from the big poset, the big black poset, to the purple poset. Okay? And so what I want to prove now which is surprising actually, I think, is that this is order preserving. Well, I don't know if it's surprising, but it's not obvious. So what this is saying is, I don't know, maybe it's not really that surprising. If, if you have in W, you have some element bigger than some other element, then the bottom representative of that coset is bigger than the bottom representative of that coset. So you can kind of say, if an element here is bigger than an element here, it's basically because this coset is bigger than this coset. That's the idea of this statement. In other words, 
w1 is less than or equal to w2, that implies that w1 super j less than or equal to w2 super j. So I'm going to prove that. And I'm going to prove it by induction on, on the big guy. So by induction on, on w2. So I induct on the length of w2. So the initial case is when the length of W2 is the smallest possible, and the smallest possible is the length of W1. But if they have the same length and they're comparable in the post set, then they have to be the same guy. So this is the initial case. Then they're the same guy, and then they have the same factorization. So there's nothing to say there. The interesting case is when that doesn't happen. So now let's say that I want to prove it for W2, and let's say that I proved it already for all smaller lengths. So assume true for lengths less than the length of W2, and let's prove it for W2. Okay. So we have W1 less than or equal to W2. Now, we know that W1 is greater than or equal to W1 super j, because W1 is in the coset of this guy, and this guy is the smallest element of that coset. Okay. I'm trying to prove that W1 super j is less than or equal to W2 super j. So if it's not true, then W2 and W2 super j must be different. Yeah, so we're done unless this is not W2 super j. Okay. So then, how is my picture going to look? Well, the thing is, again, it's good to have this picture in mind. So, Here's W1 and W2. So they live in here somewhere. Okay. W1, W2. And this one is less than this one. Okay. Now, I'm saying that W2 super J is not W2. So this guy is not the bottom element of here. And so what I'm going to do is go one step lower okay. and staying inside the post set. Now, I know that this guy is, a, is basically the, a copy of the subgroup generated by J. So when I walk around this post set, what I'm doing is multiplying by things in J. Okay. So what I'm doing is taking something like W2 times J. Yeah, so I take j in j with w2 j less than w2 okay now i know that this bottom element is the bottom element of this guy of this coset so this guy has to be w1 super j okay now you can imagine what i'm what i'm trying to do right i'm trying to prove that w1 super j is less than w2 super j. I'm trying to do it by induction. And that's why I'm trying to get lower. Because I want to go from w1 less than w2. I, I would like to somehow say, well, I already proved it for w2j. And I want to use that. Okay. That's my plan. And how do I do something like this? How do I go from w1j less than w2 to w1j less than w2j? If you remember, this is, a, this is that lifting property. Okay. So what do I need for the lifting property? I need, I need some zigzag in the post set where it's a zigzag where I multiply by a simple reflection, then I zag, and then I zig by the same reflection. Okay. 
Now, why is it that this thing points up and not down? Why is it that when I multiply by this same reflection, by this same generator J, I go up? Basically, because this guy is the bottom element of its coset. So when I, when I multiply by things in J, I'm just walking around this red blob. So I must be walking up. Okay? And so I have exactly the zigzag that I like to have to apply the lifting lemma. Okay? Um, so I'll write it in symbols, but, I, but really you should be looking at this picture. W1J is less than or equal to W2. And W1 super J is less than or equal to W1 super J. J. And then I apply my zigzag lemma, my lifting lemma, to obtain basically the, the other two things in the parallelogram. Okay. In particular, I get this one, which is the one I'm interested in. Okay. So I get that W1 super J is less than or equal to W2 J. Okay. And then I think I'm done. Why am I done? I'm done because now I can apply order per servingness because this guy has shorter length. This is shorter than W2. So I can apply my induction hypothesis to conclude that W1 super J super J is equal to W2, sorry, is less than or equal to W2J super J. But what does this mess of symbols mean? W1 super J super J is just the smallest element of this coset, and the smallest element of this coset is W1 super J. What about W2J super J? It's just the smallest element in this red blob, which I could call it W2J super J, but I can also call it W2 super J, because W2 is also in this blob. So this is this right here is W2 super J. And I obtained that W1 super J less than or equal to W2 super J. What I wanted to prove. Okay. So PJ is order preserving. All right, we'll stop there. Yeah, you're right. It should have all elements. It should have. I think it should contain every element.